God places liberation into motion. Okay. When everything required was fulfilled, it's God's plan, if, even if it's in your personal life. And now watch. Now watch, because I don't want you to get the wrong understanding. We'll say, okay, well, if it's God's plan, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. He'll just give me when he's ready to get me. Oh, no. Oh, no. Don't work like that. I said earlier, they had a cry for liberation. you got to be involved. you got to have a desire. And you have to begin that journey. Okay, they were looking for a deliverer. They were looking for somebody to deliver them. So you just can't say, okay, you know, I had somebody recently even asked me something like that. Since God's going to do what he's going to do, then I might as well not even think about it. Just keep living the way I He's going to come get me anyway. Well, that's, that's true. He is. All right, because you've been predestined, so he's going to come get you. I believe that. But you do get, you have some say in it. You get to say how tore up you're going to be when he gets to you. Okay? Now, make up your mind. All right? It's just like the Hebrews. The Hebrews were going to Egypt. Excuse me. We're going to the promised land. They're going. Well, why are they going? Because God had purposed it. They could have got there in 11 days. They could have made it in 11 days. I, I don't think it's more than three miles from the Red Sea, the beginning of the very cusp of the Red Sea, to Kadesh Barnea. If it's three or four miles, if that, it's going to take you 40 years. We can walk that. We can marathon that. Whatever the case may be. It's not that long at all. Okay? It's definitely less than 30 miles. But it took them 40 years. That tells us in our lives. But guess what? But they're going. Because it wasn't about them. It's about God. That land was, it's all about God. It's about His promises. It's about the plan that He's working. So you have to be careful that when you say, well, God won't get me there anyway. Well, yeah, He can get you there all tore up from the floor. Or he can get you there and you're in great shape, you're ready to serve him, what have you. Why would you tear up your life with an addiction and let it just destroy you, okay, so that when you're in your older age, you can't do a thing. You have no quality of life because you made decisions and you decided mentally, yeah, well, I'll just get to God when I get to him. Yeah, well, fine. If you want to be a rag doll when you get there, you'll be a rag doll when you get there. Because there are consequences of our sin decisions. We are forgiven, okay, by God. He doesn't hold us against us. But there is also a law of the flesh. And you have to reap, using an old term, and that law of the flesh, don't let me say reap, that old means it's got to come forth. So if I live a certain way, if I've addicted my body to smoke, or if I've addicted my body to alcohol, if I've addicted my body even to legal drugs, year 1, year 10, year 20, year 30, I'm going to have the impact of doing that. And I can pray for God's help, He will help me through it. But that stuff is in my body, it has manifested itself and assimilated itself into my body, and it begins to destroy my body. And now, I'm not going to be able to have the kind of health regimen in my latter days, okay, that I really could have if I had not made such a youthful, Ill and, Ill, uh, uninformed decision just because I wanted to do what I wanted to do, okay? That's the reality. All right, so anyway, when everything required was fulfilled, God places the liberation into motion. All right? All right, look here. The Hebrews had a spiritual commission. That commission required their own homeland. A homeland distinguished them as God's people. Every believer has a spiritual endowment, a spiritual commission. Every believer. And what I mean by a spiritual condition, you've got purpose in him. He wants you to be able to fulfill that purpose to the degree that you can. But, watch this. When things are fruitful and prosperous, it's not uncommon that believers lose focus on God's purpose for their lives. It's things going pretty well, right? You know what? There is something about the human experience that I have found. We just need to have a hammer hanging over our heads. For some reason, we just got to have a cloud over us. We got to have a hammer. We're just not going to stay consistent. Our prayers are not going to be intense. The watch of our walk is not going to be intense. Now watch that. When I say our prayers and watching our walk, I don't mean to, I don't mean to be saved. You're already saved. 
Okay, but I mean to ensure that you've got to kind of fellowship with God so he can get the purpose out of our life. He owns us. We don't own ourselves. And we ought to be in place where he can use us as his vessels. All right? Again, we continue on with God declaring the time of liberation. The Hebrews were not going to depart from Egypt based on their prosperity and their success. Man, they in Egypt, man, they're the state. Oh, we like this Egypt thing. We like this place. Okay, where would we go anyway? You know, because we love it here. All right? Now, their cry originated from what? The passage of time and changing circumstances. That sounds a lot like the prodigal son. He having a ball. But with the passage of time and changing of circumstances, here comes that cry. Now look, the term here that you often hear is that a person has to bottom out. How many of us have heard that? Raise our hand. We've heard that before. you got to bottom out. Okay? And or what we call it Christ-based counseling, we call it prodigal motivation. Okay? And so we know that's what caused their cry. Alright? But in Christ-based counseling, L&D therapy, bottoming out is not the key. A person can bottom out and stay, stay at the bottom out and never do turn around. Okay? And we see that in the life of Judas, who bottomed out, but never recovered from his obsession with monetary gain until it was too late. So it's not just, well, you got to wait till they bottom out. Bottom out, that's not enough. It sounds right in terms of a secular approach. But we're talking about Christ-based approach. All right? All right, we continue on with the dynamics of liberation. And that God declares the time of liberation. The habituated believer chooses to begin addictive behavior. At some point, they begin. But God decides when to liberate the believer. Now, you may choose to get in, but you're not going to choose to get out. You're going to have to be, because it's so overwhelming and powerful. You, you know, the habitual believer has allowed something into your life that now you have, that has changed you down. Remember, we talked about the Egyptians. They're all powerful, so they believe. And so the Hebrews can see that they're powerful. They got all the military. They got all the resources. You're locked in. Okay, ask somebody who's in the penitentiary. They just can't run out of there when they get ready. Somebody can let them out. They may even find a way to squeeze out, but they will find themselves right back in there again. Okay? Alright, so you got to have somebody who liberates you. Okay? So, <clears throat> God liberates us. He does it so that we will not return. That's what I love. He does it in such a way so we won't return to it. So let's take a look at the fourth principle of liberation deliverance therapy. Habituated believers place their trust in God's time. Okay? They place their trust in God's time. Okay? That's another principle that we learn from this experience of the Hebrews in Egypt. Alright, we continue on. God assaults the benefactor of the addiction. Somebody benefiting from the addiction. All right, and by benefiting, I mean, I mean not the person with the habituated activity. Somebody's benefiting, okay? If the person has a gambling addiction, who's benefiting? Whoever, you know, is operating the gambling facilities, okay? So whatever it is, somebody, if I have an alcohol, if I'm an alcoholic, who's benefiting? The alcoholic industry. If I got a cigarette, if I'm addicted to cigarettes, who's benefiting? The tobacco company. See, somebody is benefiting from that behavior. That's the reason why uh, there's major concern when, as, as just to give you an example, they want to start making flavored cigarettes so it's more attractive to younger people. All right. But the lawmakers know. Well, wait a minute. You know, we you know we, we can't have that kind of thing. We're not going to addict our children. Okay, to something that we know that is toxic, poisonous, and it's going to lead that's, it's going to lead to extraordinary health issues. Okay, all right. But who's the benefactor? The tobacco company. All right. There's always, but but we want you to understand. God assaults the benefactor of the addiction. Okay. God assaults the person or thing which benefit. An enemy of the believer is an enemy of God. Okay. All right. So here's the fifth principle. 
God will break anyone or anything supporting a believer's habituated behavior. If you give me a person who is truly born again, and they've been addicted to something, anybody who's feeding that, don't be a, a feeder of an addiction or a, to the habituated believer. All right? So that's one of the principles. Here's another. Relapse in the midst of recovery. This is something we really need to understand. It is a process. So when a person is advancing and growing, we need to expect there are going to be times when they trip and fall. Now, it's great if the person doesn't. But when it does, and if it does, and when it does happen, we shouldn't fall apart as supporters, as counselors, as loved ones, because there is relapse in the midst of recovery. Okay? Remember, before complete recovery, there is deception before deliverance or relapse amidst the recovery. Why is this? It required a series of plagues, calamities, and apparent setbacks before it required a series of them. Okay? So therefore, faith and faith-filled focus is imperative. One moment, it looks like we're really going. Then we fall back. It looks like we're going up the mountain again, and we fall back. Okay? So you just have to be, remember we use that term, longevity. You know, it's a long-term matter. It's going to take a while. All right. But we do know this. Liberation to the believer is assured. God had a purpose. He proclaimed it. They were not called to stay in Egypt. Okay? We're not called to, to, to addictive behavior. We're not called to that. We're not called to habituated behavior. Okay? Above all, he did not call them to be enslaved to another God. Okay? And sometimes we've got to ask the question, who's your God? If you just get the heebie-jeebies because that thing, you know, well, I just couldn't help myself. Who's your God? Okay? All right, we continue on. So the habituated believers can embrace the same principle. Under worsening conditions, God is liberated. When, when under the work, He's liberated in that circumstance. Okay? There is a work in the belief that will be completed. I'm the way, I, I love the way Paul said it. I am confident in this. That the work which began in you will be completed to the day of Christ Jesus. Alright? Confident. I love that word. Habituated believers and significant others who sincerely cry for recovery can expect deceptive events and activities during recovery. Okay? Then expect, you can expect deceptive events and activities during recovery. Alright. We continue with the dynamics of liberation part. Okay? Let's take a look at personal liberation. Interdiction and duration. Personal liberation, interdiction and liberation. Alright, we all want liberation immediately. We know that. We've said that. We've shared. We, we want it to happen right now. Okay? But only when God decides will we be liberated. And again, as we mentioned earlier, that doesn't mean, okay, well, I just... No, no, no. You need the journey. The journey of looking and seeking and working this and trying that. You need that journey. Okay? Habituated believers and loved ones must trust the Lord. This highlights interdiction. Interdiction, by the way, the word, if you would look up in the dictionary, it's actually a religious term. That's the whole point of something. You know, we hear that. You know, we've got illegals, as it's called, as, it's, as they are referred to, coming across the border. You know, our illegal drugs coming across. We need to interdict. Okay? And that really means we need to get to it and stop it before it gets there. And that word interdiction really means a religious prohibition. So let's take a look at the precursor to liberation. And precursor, again, means something that's the setup to it. Okay? Psalms 51 is viewed as David's confession of his sin against God. Alright? And it says this. Psalms 51, 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the greatness of thy compassion, blot out my transgressions. Okay? The next verse, Psalms 51, 2. Wash me thoroughly 
from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3, Psalms 51, 3. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Alright? So let's talk about this as we look at personal liberation, interdiction, and direction. Okay? David admits, he, he admits, he confesses a high-minded offense. You know, what do we mean that? Okay, when you use the term transgression, sin, there's three categories of sin. Missing the mark, okay? Trespass, transgression. Missing the mark, trespass, transgression. Let's talk about the differences. Okay, missing the mark may not necessarily mean anything that I did, did or didn't do anything that, had, that was moral of any nature. Uh, if Jonah is supposed to go to Nineveh, as an example, but goes to Tarsus, there's no necessarily no moral issue involved. He just didn't do what God told him to do. So therefore, it was he was missing the mark. Okay, that's what missing mark. Missing mark means I just didn't do what God told me to do. All right. Okay, had nothing to do necessarily with a quote moral issue. Technically, you can say it's a moral issue anytime you don't do what God says. But I think you understand what I mean. No, no ten commandment issue. Okay? That's missing the mark. And then you have a trespass. A trespass is something that you have done and you didn't know it was wrong. Or you didn't have the strength. Okay, You, you just didn't realize the impact of it. So you did it but you didn't know that. That's a trespass. But a transgression is quite different. We say transgression means premeditation. I looked at it. I planned it. I thought about it. I knew it was wrong. Not only that, I have the ability not to do it. You know what I mean by the ability not to do it? I, mean, I liked what I saw and I really liked it, but I didn't really have to do it. It wasn't like it just gripped me and made me do it, you know. Transgression is the high mind sin. His sin required planning, timing, and follow through. Okay? And this is what I refer to as the addiction threshold. You haven't started it yet, but you're plotting it, you're planning it, you're looking at it, okay? So let's take a look at this, 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 this plotting, planning, kicking it around in my mind, I'm thinking about it, okay? We're talking about transgression. And yes, the retribution, the punishment, the correction for a transgression is greater than just somebody who missed a mark, a trespass, okay? All right, this is the period, this addiction threshold is the period when the believer is contemplating the sin and its consequences. Okay, now the worst thing that can happen to me if I do this, what can happen to me if I do it? Okay, see that you got plenty of time, you're thinking about it, you're plotting it. Now what's the worst that can happen to me if I do it? And you will estimate, you'll come up with an answer. Okay, watch this. This is the reason why in counseling, Give you a good example. Somebody, a family breaks up. Okay. Uh, somebody walks out, man, woman, it doesn't matter. Okay. And a lot of times when I say this, people don't understand it, but there's a spiritual basis for it. And what you have to do, because of the way that sin works, the person who is thinking about what they're going to do is trying to consider what the implications are going to be. Okay. What you got to do is help them see what the implication is. Because they're not thinking about you. They're just thinking about the implication. They're gonna, they want to do what they're going to do. And they're just thinking. So what you got to do is you got to up the ante. You got That's the saying. That's a you know, saying in games and, and in gap. You got to make the stakes look much higher so that they can see the stakes. If you take the prodigal son, the prodigal son wants his money. Because that's all he's thinking about. If I can get my money, he's thinking about the good part. I'll be able to do this. I'll have that money. I can do that. You're not helping him see the dark side of that. So you've got to help people see the dark side of the decision. Now they still may do it, but get it in front of them. So very often, some husband will do something or some wife will do something. And I'll say, it. get those papers ready. Get them in front of them. So because as they are thinking about what they're doing, they're not thinking about that part. Okay. Pull the car, pull the cards, pull everything. 
so that they can see what it's really going to cost them as quickly as, as long as they can have the benefit of all of those things that they've been provided through that relationship, whether it is a parent or whether it is a spouse, they're never going to come to grips with the, with the decision they have been made until way too late and way down the line. The faster you can get them to come to grips with what it is that they're doing, the greater the chance that they will rethink what they're doing. Okay? All right. But, but anyway, this addiction threshold is the period when the believer is contemplating the sin and its consequences. No doubt David considered God's command prior to committing this sin to take another man's wife. All right? Now watch this. Watch this. This is how sin works. He's just thinking about the fact that he's got this man's wife and how he's going to deal with it if anything happens to him. First off, he's not thinking he's going to be caught. But if he is caught, he's got no idea that he's going to have to have the man killed. That's the way that sin operates. It just starts you at one level. It starts you at one place. And then before you know it, you're at a totally different place. How many spouses have gotten themselves into an argument, gotten themselves to a shoving match, and then before you know it, somebody's dead? They had no idea. I didn't mean all that. I just was doing this. But it got out of hand. Somebody got their hands around somebody's neck. And before you know it, somebody is dead. Okay? That's how incredible, that's how devastating, that's how insidious sin is. It starts at a very, what looks like a manageable, it looks like sin is man. Sin is not manageable. You cannot calculate it. Okay? particularly its consequences. So no doubt David considered God's commands prior to committing this sin. I have no doubt about it. Because believers are provided a spiritual hedge. When you're a believer, you just can't break out and do something of that nature. Okay? We're going to violate another man and have his wife knowing that that is corporal punishment for that. That that is... That is just one of the high, most high-minded things that you could do concerning our relationship with God. He knew that. Okay? An incredible verse, the book of Ecclesiastes 10 8. It says, the person who breaks a hedge, a serpent will bite. There's a hedge around believers. Alright? Remember in the book of Job, you know, Satan goes before, before God and it's almost as if God had been, you know, looking here and there. Satan had been looking to and fro and he comes up almost in the, it's almost written like he comes in the face of God and says, hey, guess what? You don't have nobody down there on that earth. Nobody's worshiping you. Nobody's serving you. And it's almost as if God said, have you considered my servant Job? And almost as if he'd be bragging on him. Okay? Yeah, but Satan responds and says what? Yeah, but see, you got a hedge around him. Oh my good. Thank God for the hedge. Amen? Amen. Okay? So believers have a hedge, but if you break that hedge. Alright, because the whole thing with an addiction is to not begin it in the first place. Remember, we showed you the chart. Okay? It hasn't gripped your life before that. Alright? And you know, everybody's got that thing. Ah, you know, we rationalize incredibly. We talk about this just a little later. I just want to do it one time. How often have you said, remember there was a commercial? If I, I can just eat one chip, okay? Nobody opens a bag of potato chips and just get one chip out of it and eat. You know, you just can't do it. You just gonna keep on and go from one chip. Then what happens? In just a few minutes, you find yourself back in the bag again, and after a while, the whole bag is gone. Okay? And it's the same way as sin. I ah, just do it one time. But guess what? That's all Satan wants you to do. It is one time. Then you're on his turf. You ready? All right, so let's take a look at the sixth principle. Never pierce, all right, a spiritual head. Don't pierce it in the first place. You already got all these warnings around. Don't pierce it, okay? Thinking stuff like, hey, I know God will forgive me, and I'm just going to do it one time. Incredible. That, talk, that means that we have this such darkness within us. David pierced the spiritual walls, the spiritual reminders, the spiritual prohibitions. And he committed adultery. Okay? 
And then there's the incredible account of Nathan that we share again and again, coming to David and giving him this parable. Alright? Now watch this. When David was told the parable as an outsider, oh, he could see the wrong and error of this person. Because watch this. David knew the parable represented a real person. He knew Nathan was talking about a real person. And so David sat in his judgment seat and was able to render judgment about this person who had simply taken a little lamb for a meal, okay, let alone devastating a man's household, all right, and then having him killed. So David could clearly see as an outsider, all right? Now watch this. Because Nathan, of course, tells him, you are the man. All right? Now watch this. And then he goes on to tell, this is how he explained David. I, that is God, I anointed you, David. It's almost happening. It's, it's almost as God said, how in the world could you do that to me? See, when we sin and we fall into something like that, it is a personal affront to the God who loved us, who saved us, who maintained us, who put us in place, who elevated us. When we sin like that, it's a personal affront to Him. We take His purpose in us and we just take it through the mud. Okay? In my estimation, nothing is worse, in a sense, than a person with God's purpose who has lost their integrity, who has lost their walk, who has lost the way that people perceive them because they did something that was so horrific, so damaging. And once you place that damage in the minds of people, they can forgive you and love you, but it's something about the mind and the way that it works, that stuff continues to come back in your mind. That's why it's difficult to listen to somebody. That's why it's difficult to be up under somebody when that kind of thing happens. Okay? It doesn't mean that God can't still use them, but if they were in a location or a place, you're probably not going to be able to be effective there anymore. It doesn't mean people don't love you. It doesn't mean they won't come around you. But, but your effectiveness has reached its height. David's empire, for lack of a better term, his kingdom would never be the same again. That's historical fact. His kingdom would never be the same again. Okay? Don't you want to get all that God would have out of you? Don't you want to just completely be able to use you thoroughly and completely? Alright? But anyway, Nathan said to you, God anointed me. He delivered you from Saul. He gave you your master's house. He gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if you wanted more, he would have given that to you. Now, don't you dare believe that, he, that this, all, these things only came to David's mind after the sin. These things came to his mind before David. Don't, don't, don't do that. What you're thinking about doing, don't do that. Okay, you're anointed. God's giving you Saul this. He's giving you this. He's giving you this. He's done that for you. He's done this. Don't, don't do that. All right? All right. These are thoughts the Spirit brings to our attention before we sin. Now let's take a look at, we do a comparison. Let's take a look at, at Joseph's experience. Okay? This whole experience where he is in Potiphar's house and the scripture says that, her, uh, that Potiphar's wife's eyes were upon Joseph because he was handsome. Joseph was a hunk. Alright? Alright? And she had the hots for Joseph. All right? She's burning up for him, blessing for him. Okay? She asked him, come lie with me. But he refused. Watch what he says in refusing her. He says, first, the master does not concern himself. He's talking about Potiphar. He don't concern himself with me. He trusts me completely. He sees within me a virtuous man. He knows he is not even a, quote, believer. He is not even, quote, a religious man. But he even knows there's something special about me. Okay? He puts all he owns into my charge. Everybody but you. Alright? There's no one greater in this house. He's withheld nothing from me again but you. How could I do this great evil? And sin, I love this, against God. And that's what I meant. 
that when we have something in our lives that we have allowed to entrap our lives, okay, we got that thing is an affront to the God who saves us. Okay? All right. Let's take more principles of interdiction from Joseph's story. All right? His thinking was clear. It was persuasive and determined. He wasn't going there. He made up his mind, I'm not doing it. That doesn't mean he wasn't tempted by the woman. All right? Because if you got to run away, which he did, he's tempted. Okay? He's a man. And it means we don't have to fall to everything. Everything, because remember, if he falls that first time, he's through. You know, when we look at the comparison of David, all right? David going to get the woman and move her in his house. Okay? All right, make it look like, well, one of his soldiers died, and so he's going to bring the woman. And tell, look, King David is bringing her into his own house. You know, King David having sexual relationships with him. Have mercy. Okay? And it just shows you the thing just entraps you. Now, that's very interesting when we look at that about David as opposed to the harem that he had, who Absalom went into, and then what he did, he never had sex with them again, but he took care of them. But this woman that he's done this thing with, he's going to bring her into his home. And of course, the way that our God does, being the marvelous God he is, we know Jesus comes to that relationship. All right? We give you that one for free as a sign. All right. All right, let's continue to look at this. Joseph's thinking was clear. He was persuasive and determined. He wasn't going there. Under day-to-day -day pressure, he would not listen. He heard, but he didn't listen. That's a big difference. It means by saying he wouldn't listen, he wouldn't let those thoughts just manifest itself. If you do that, if you let, you just keep your mind on it, and you let it just dominate you, you get ready to go do that thing. Okay? All right? It's kind of interesting. When you're in the counseling ministry, any length of time, say this very personal, you're in close quarters with people, and you're talking with people, male and female. If you're in this business, there's going to be somebody who are going to have interest in you beyond counseling. Okay? That comes with the turf. All right? And it's one of those things as a counselor, you don't like that stuff in your or a minister or whatever, a clergy. You don't like that stuff in your head. There are adulterers, there are whoremongers in the house of the Lord. Now, are you shocked? I hope you're not shocked because I'm telling you. There are persons who give themselves, who will come and tell you I'm adulterous, who will tell you I've been involved in adulterous relationships. Okay? All right? Now, that's extraordinary. If you cannot take that, if you cannot accept, you can't counsel in that circumstance. And it's even why sometimes I've had the experience where somebody has told me that they were in an adulterous relationship with the minister, and guess what I said? Time out right now. You're going to need a female to counsel you. Okay? Well, why would you do that? Because I understand the dynamics of adultery. A spouse may know that you're involved, but they don't know who it is. And here I am counseling you. Okay? And they have some sense that it is a minister. And I'm the one counseling? I'm not going to come up dead for anybody. Okay? I got none of the pleasure of that sin. You know, sin is a pleasure for a season. Since we're talking about Moses and the Hebrews. That's what scripture said. It's a pleasure for a season. That's why you end up getting addicted to it. Because it is a pleasure. Okay? Well, I didn't get any of that pleasure and I'm not dying for him. I don't want to be in the newspaper. Okay, somebody shot Dr. Davidson, and it looks like apparently he was in some kind of relationship with somebody. That's not true, that's not accurate, so I know what to do. I see this one already coming. God will destroy, I can tell you all kinds of things. You know, people will come into your confines, and they tell you that they did something horrific to a child, but nobody else knows. You tell me that, you get ready to go to jail. All right, because I'm not going to hold this ministry, all right, captive by something that you did and then you come here and tell me and I'm supposed to have confidentiality. That's the reason why in a counseling plan for those of you, when you go to that counseling plan, it tells you to tell them, don't tell you anything like that. Okay? Because you don't want to have your ministry in bondage 
to some type of in, uh, 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 some type of irresponsible behavior that somebody became involved in. Amen? Amen. But nevertheless, I started by saying this whole thing, you don't like to have that kind of information in your head. That's extraordinarily powerful for some female, if you're a man, or some man, if you're a woman, to come tell you that they've had a, you know, a, a neutral relationship with somebody, a counselor or somebody else. They're talking to you when they say that. You know, I had another experience where a woman began to tell me about her dreams. Okay, and she dreamed that she was in this relationship with somebody. You know who the relationship was? Me. Okay, so you're going to have these experiences. They're going, and you, you, you don't like that stuff in your head because it keeps going around in your head and you keep feeding on it. You know, and you keep having to, I mean, we use that term, man, that stuff is messing with me. I don't like to hear that kind of stuff. Okay, but Joseph heard it, but he didn't let it just become manifested in his heart. Because if you do, you're going to start leaning towards that thing. And before you know it, you're gone. Okay? So, he did not allow her pleading to become rooted in his heart. He avoided her presence by staying away. Okay? Alright. So, the seventh principle. Habituated believers must avoid addicts who encourage or influence habituated behavior. You certainly got to stay away from the things and the persons who do the same thing. All right? Now, no doubt, David had the same thoughts. Joseph withstood. He withstood. David went on and did. All right? And committed the heinous act. And once you do that, you're trapped. And that concludes this particular session. Amen. Amen.